today we have lined up for a very exciting day of deliberations and discussions and starting with a very important international symposium that is related to the current theme of the conference the symposium 3 on health and demographic surveillance systems and ncds this very important symposium will be chaired by professor tintin su from jeffrey chi school of medicine and health sciences malaysia and professor chanuntong tansan or dean city as we are already as we are fondly call her the dean faculty of health mahidol university thailand over to you professor tintin to start the proceedings okay good morning everyone so um welcome to a symposium. So first I would like to thank Sir Professor Luan Yu, Professor Indika, and the organizing committee to give us an opportunity to share how we set up HDSS and then also the research finding from HDSS. So uh, my co-chair is a Professor uh, Chan Yuan Tong from uh, University of Mahido. So uh, Prof, uh, do you want to say anything? Right. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting, the concept that you are going to present on the symposium, the team. So uh, because you are the team to present, let me, uh, let me do the uh, introduction for all of you because it's such a good idea. So Sawadika, everybody, uh, this welcome to the symposium from the CIRGO, which stands for Southeast Asia Community of Observatory. Uh, uh, by Monash University Malaysia campus, and it will be run by Professor Tin Tin Su, who is the chair of the session. Um, I think it will be very interesting to hear how the team has uh, developed to present their own series of research finding on the role of the HDSS, Health uh, Demographic Surveillance System, and investigating the NCD. Um, I think the investigation on the NCDs, healthcare needs, and health system challenges will be very uh, fruitful as it is an innovative research platform and a community lab for monitoring NCD in the low middle income countries. The session will be run by four presenters, heading by Professor Dr. Tin Tin Su, Dr. Tan Min Min, Ms. Ong She Wei, and Dr. Devi Mohan. Let me introduce Professor Tin Tin Su, who is the leader. She is a professor of public health and director of the Southeast Asia Community Observatory uh, Health and Demographic Surveillance System, SDSS. JC School of Medicine and Health Science, Monash University, Malaysia. She obtained her doctorate in medicine from the School of Medicine, Heidelberg University, Germany. Professor Su also passionate about improving population health via the community engagement, social epidemiology and implementation science research. Her research has been supported by the World Health Organization, Medical Research UK, John Templeton Foundation USA, Ministry of Education Malaysia, and various internal grants. Professor Su is a committee member of the Raisin Forum Asian HDSS Network. She's an honorary professor at the University of Malaya, Malaysia, and a visiting scholar at the Queen's University of Belfast. May I have request Professor Su to run the symposium? Over to you, Professor Tin Tin Su. Thank you very much. And thank you for a very nice introduction, Madam Chairperson. Uh, good morning, everyone, a greeting from uh, Kuala Lumpur. So today we are going to share how we set up HDSS and then also research finding. So uh, my co-presenters are Professor Daniel Redpart. He is uh, my predecessor. And then also he established a wonderful work in setting up uh, HTCCO HDSS with his better half, uh, Professor uh, Pascal Alote. And then Ms. Anchue, she is a research officer from uh, Southeast Asia Community Observatory and Mr. Roshidi. So he is a statistician. So I also acknowledge all CICO teams 
uh, to make a wonderful um, research platform. So first I would like to introduce you know, what is HAL and Demography Surveillance System because uh, a lot of people still don't know what is a HAL and Demography Surveillance System. We call it HDSS. HDSS is a dynamic and open cohort. It's based on regular longitudinal surveillance of the entire population within the defined geographic location. So why people set up the HDSS? Why HDSS are set up? Because of there are lack of, lack of population data on health and demography, particularly in the low and middle income country. How HDSS operates, normally it's a census update that conducted six to 24 month cycle. And then to repeat core set of demographic, social economic and health status related questionnaire and to provide an accurate population denominator at any point in time. So how many HDSS uh, in the world? Altogether, 47 HDSS free site, uh, over 3 million population in 19 low and middle income country in Africa, Asia, and Oceania. So SIPO is one of the HDSS. So generally, HDSS is based on a social ecological model. So uh, the health is shaped by individual, interpersonal, uh, community, organization, uh, policies, laws, and other culture. Normally, HDSS has a potential to cover all determinants uh, in social ecological model. So how HDSS operate and what is the opportunity of HDSS? I'm going to demonstrate by using Southeast Asia Community Observatory. It is established since 2011. So SICO is established as a community health observatory to conduct life course research project and then complex health interventions. We start with the census and then we follow up people longitudinally until death. So we also accept migration, but immigration, death and out migrations are also recorded. So there's several opportunity to do a nested cross-sectional study. And then we can do several nested longitudinal study based on the age group, like adolescent cohort and uh, elderly cohort or a disease-based uh, cohort like um, hypertension, diabetes cohort. So we, we also uh, try to figure out you know, what is the cause of death and then changing trend of the cause of death. So, so far we have 40,000 residents in the Sakama district who are involved in the community observatory. So the SICO mission is to provide high quality infrastructure for conducting communities based whole of life research. And we are community health laboratory, like I uh, mentioned before. And then now SICO is aimed to envision the role of HDSS in investigation, non-communicable diseases, health needs and health system research. And then we will demonstrate a kind of series of uh, research presentation with my team. So where SICO HDSS locate? We are in the Johor state in the Malaysia. So Johor is a southern state of Malaysia. And then Sagama district, you know, situated in the Johor state. So in Sagama district, you know, there are 11 sub-districts and then SICO operate in five sub-districts include uh, 12,000 households and around uh, 40,000 individuals involved in our SICO HDSS. So Sagamax you know, is a kind of uh, semi-urban area. So there are urban area and there also there are rural area, very typical uh, district in Malaysia. So what is the strength of the SICO? So we have a representation of Malaysian ethnicity, Malay, Chinese, Indian, and Aborigines, and they're also immigrants. We did a very proper stakeholder engagement, particularly Ministry of Health. So we have already signed a memorandum of understanding since 2018, September, and Director General of Ministry of Health is our CIPO advisory board member. And then three directors from MOH are the part of scientific advisory group. And then we collaborate very well with the district health office and Sagama district hospital. So we also have a very good connection with uh, Ministry of Rural Development. We work very well with district administrative office, uh, police office. Last but not the least, you know, community. So community engagement is a cornerstone of um, establishment of SICO HDSS. Uh, the stakeholders, uh, possible stakeholders are mapping out 
and then engage individually and then you know, according to the organization, particularly hospitals, district health office, district administrative office, the police office, and then also agriculture-based settlement. There are a lot of uh, immigrants are working there. So we formed the community engagement committee. So there are five uh, community engagement committee. And then the role of community engagement committee is uh, to support SQL related activity and then to assist uh, getting maximum response rate you know, from the community and then act as a liaison person between SQL and the community. So this is a community engagement model that SQL adopted inform, consult, involve, and then empower the community. So we have also several modes of communication on our research and the finding of the research through social media, poster, flyers, newspaper, booth and events, and then to also distribute information sheet. So we are already nine years journey of SICO. So those are um, blood, sweat, and tear. So we completed an ongoing you know, core project since 2012 with uh, 38,000 participants, since 2017 with 39,000 participants. We have a health round data collections uh, 2013 and 2018 with 25 and 24,000 participants. And then maternal and infant of uh, SQL settlement project, Bravo autopsy. And then we are in the progress of establishing SQL settlement hospital of sanctuary registry. And then we completed uh, 20 individual projects and then several ongoing projects are in planning. So we received ISO 9001 certificates. So that means, you know, SQL process of data collection is according to ISO standard. And then SQL is the only one HDSS across the globe who has an ISO 9001 certificate. So here I want to clear, clarify, you know, what differences between core projects and individual projects. Core projects are the projects one HDSS uh, should be doing. And then it is uh, funded by Monash University Australia and Monash University Malaysia and JC School of Medicine and Health Science. Individual projects are funded by the external, um, external funders. So we have a funders and collaborators across the globe, like World Health Organization, Wellcome Trust, and then John Temperton Foundation, MRC UK, UKRI, of course, we have a Malaysian uh, uh, funders like MITE, Malaysia Industry Go uh, Government Group uh, for High Technology under the Prime Minister Office and Ministry of Education Malaysia. And then we also have a collaborator across the globe. And there also we have a very strong collaboration with the University of Malaya. And I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, information on SQL core projects. For example, census 2012 and 2017, we collected demographic, social economic information of so the individual and households. We also collected you know, illness information on hypertension, diabetes, joint pain, cancer, and renal diseases. And the in health ground data collection was conducted in 2013, 2018, and 19. And then we did the blood pressure measurement, a blood glucose measurement, and the anthropometric measurement. So those are the informations available, not only the measurements, you know, we have a several uh, questionnaires which can cover a lot of information on so health service utilization, out-of-pocket payment, and then their general health, uh, lifestyles factor like in nutrition, physical activities, and also non-communicable diseases, particularly for diabetes and hypertension. If you're interested uh, to know how HDSS set up, SQL HDSS set up, and then more information, you can go through this uh, uh, paper. It's an open access, so you can download anytime. So I would like to give you a brief background of the findings. So this is a Malaysian census uh, 2010. So Malaysian census is conducted every 10 years, and currently 2020 national census is ongoing. So this is a 2012 SQL census. You can clearly see there are several uh, populations are lacking. We call it rural bites. So particularly people who leave the rural area for study and for job opportunity. Sometimes they come back and then sometimes they don't come back. So what happened with the rural area? So there are a lot of you know, elderly populations. And then now 
Before in 2012, the male and females, you know, figures are more or less similar. And then now the females and uh, numbers are getting higher and higher. So this is also not uncommon findings. And it is a global trend of uh, feminization in aging. I think SIKO is in the start of the feminization of aging, uh, particularly in the rural Malaysia. So by looking at the rural and urban migration and demographic shift, so it changed the portfolio of the healthcare needs for the left behind you know, older rural population. The earlier maternal and child needs in the rural areas are being overshadowed by the health needs of the aging population like NCD, multimorbidity and geriatric syndrome. So HDSS can present a cost-effective and innovative research platform for identification of changes in health needs and challenges and the health service delivery and also healthcare financing. So this is a health round profile. So it's more or less similar with uh, Malaysian uh, population uh, profiles. Apart from the age, we have a little bit more older uh, age group. So once you look at the health profile of the health round, um, uh, health round conducted in 2013 and 2018, uh, it's very obviously the overweight is increased, uh, obesity is increased, central obesity is also increased, the known diabetes and known hypertension are increased. But I took it, you know, this is very, uh, very positive, you know, findings. It's better to be known, you know, rather than unknown. And then blood pressure, it seems, you know, a little bit more under control. And then also blood sugars are a little bit more under control, but it's very difficult to say about uh, blood glucose because we did uh, run the blood glucose. We didn't do the fasting blood glucose and then we didn't do uh, HbA1c. So we tried to develop a cascade of care. So this is just a, a descriptive data analysis by looking at screens, you know, whether blood pressure or blood glucose are measured and then whether the uh, hypertension and diabetes are diagnosed whether the populations you know, currently receiving treatment and then whether they are, their blood pressure and uh, blood glucose are under control. So you can see the trend of uh, hypertension care cascade and diabetes you know, care cascade. Compared to 2013, you know, there are a lot of you know, improvement in 2018 in terms of uh, screening and diagnosis. But you can see so that the last column is the ones, you know, uh, everyone is interested, you know, people who has a disease, you know, as much as um, uh, we want to have uh, blood pressure control and blood glucose control, it is said to see only around, you know, 15% of the hypertension individuals, you know, their blood pressures are under control. And diabetes is a little bit, you know, better than uh, hypertension. So around one third of the population who has a diabetes has a blood glucose are under control. So it seems, you know, there are a lot of work that we have to do to, to lift uh, cascade of, to lift uh, of the gap of the cascade of care, particularly to increase uh, their health literacy. We need to do a lot of um, uh, behavior interventions. So this uh, cascade of care is a visualized a proportion of the individual living with hypertension and diabetes a different stage of care continuum for screening to control. So when patients are lost and then when limited public health resources and interventions you know, could be targeted. The cascade of care approach you know, in HDSS can identify the uh, care continuum to implement the effective and evidence-based you know, intervention according to need versus a service gap. So uh, CICO has a very good opportunity for capacity building in NCD research. So Monash is uh, going towards a research intensive university. Of course, uh, Monash Australia has already been a um, research intensive university. Um, but Monash Malaysia is going towards um, research intensive university. And then we, are, we have a merit scholarship for HDR. So master and PhD students. And then there are opportunity to do a postdoctoral research fellow in Monash, uh, Malaysia, and also in the SICO. And currently we are very much interested to look uh, intersection of COVID-19 and NCD. And there are more presentations from my team, so you know, mental health across the cascade of care in managing hypertension. It can show intersection of mental health and NCD. 
So very interesting and the emerging themes you know, during COVID-19, mental health is getting more and more uh, important. And the prediction of 10 years cardiovascular risk of the community dweller and the population white as screening for atrial fibrillation. So it can show heart and brain health of uh, elderly uh, people. So the way forward. So not only we are focusing on local, we establish a regional networking. So recently we established Asian HDSS network with India, Vadu HDSS, from Bangladesh, a three HDSS, Metlab HDSS, Chakaria HDSS, Dhaka, Aben HDSS, and Malaysia, Siko HDSS, the Vietnam Chile Lab under the Hanoi University of Public Health, and Indonesia, uh, Salama HDSS under the University of uh, Gajamada. So uh, all together we have um, 300,000 uh, population. So I really hope uh, next um, uh, APEC 2021, uh, we will be having another symposium on Asia HDSS and then we can inform more findings and then more interesting uh, uh, finding from Asian HDSS. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending our symposium. And you can find all information you know, from monash.edu.my. And then if you want to know more about SQL, you can go to SQL website, uh, monash.edu.my slash SQL. And then you can contact me through my email uh, address. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to get uh, your comments and suggestions. Uh, so, uh, after the end of my presentation, I would like to call upon the second presenters. It is a, uh, she is a Dr. Tamin Min. Dr. Tamin Min is a research fellow of the Southeast Asia Community Observatory SICO, Jeffrey Charles School of Medicine and Health Science, Monash University, Malaysia. Her current research is uh, to examine the association of religion, spirituality, and physical and mental health along older adults in the Sagama. She's also interested in other psychosocial determinants of health and genetics epidemiology, especially in the utilization of polygenic risk for in uh, risk stratification. Mimi, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, Mimi. Okay. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Min Min from SICO, uh, Monash University, Malaysia. Um, today, I'm going to share with you um, our project entitled Mental Distress Along the Cascade of Care in Managing Hypertension. So first, let's look at uh, some statistics related to uh, mental distress. Uh, globally, depression affects 264 million people and this is one of the top 20 leading causes of disability-adjusted life years, DELIS. In Southeast Asia, 27% of the people are living with depression and 23% are living with anxiety. In Malaysia, my country, depression and anxiety are the top 10 causes of DELIS. Among those 16 years old and above, 1.7% have generalized anxiety disorder and the prevalence of depression increased from 1.8% in 2015 to 2.3% in 2019. Now, the percentages uh, might seem very small, but if you multiply them uh, with the total population in Malaysia, the numbers come in hundreds of thousands. So mental distress is, uh, is complex and is influenced by many factors. And one of them is physical illness. So um, it's not surprising that if you have a chronic illness, right, that um, it, it, if the chronic illness seems to have no end, then you get depressed easily. For our study, we focus on hypertension. So in South Africa, hypertension was found to be associated with increased anxiety disorder in the past 12 months. However, in other studies in Hong Kong and Southern Brazil, there was no association. There are many studies on the factors influencing hypertension itself, but there is a lack of studies on the association between mental distress and hypertension, especially in Asian countries. Now let's zoom in to Malaysia. So here are some statistics uh, related to hypertension in Malaysia. 
So three in 10 adults in Malaysia um, have hypertension. That is equivalent to 6.4 million Malaysians. Of the three out of 10, only 50% are aware of their hypertension. And of the 50%, uh, 90% are taking hypertensive medication. However, of the 90%, only 45% uh, have their blood pressure under control. So what I have just shown you in the pre of hypertension care cascade, like what Professor Tintin has described just now in her presentation. So a hypertension care cascade will show you where along the hypertension care that patients are lost to care. It will inform policy makers in setting up hypertension care policies and help to assess health system performance, like uh, where along the cascade can the system be enhanced and then to improve efficacy of health interventions. Uh, where along the cascade can interventions be planned to reduce loss of patients? The loss of patients along the hypertension care cascade are associated with social demographic factors. However, there is a lack of studies that examine mental health along the hypertension care cascade. So the aims of our the study specifically are to construct a hypertension care cascade for Malaysians and then to look at the association between different levels of hypertension care and mental health along the cascade. Our study was cross-sectional using data from SICO uh, Health Round 2013. So this was dis also described by Prof Tintin just now. So individuals age 35 and above um, were included in the Health Round 2013. So of this uh, 25,000 individuals, 6,584 were hypertensive and included in this study. So uh, what we measure included mental health. So for mental health, we use the depression, anxiety, and stress 21, DAS 21 scale. And then we also collected uh, data about social demographics and diabetes status. So here is a photo of one of our data collectors in SICO, uh, wearing SICO vest and interviewing a participant. So here is our uh, definition of hypertension and how we construct the cascade. So we use the World Health Organization stepwise questionnaire on hypertension. If the patients ever had their blood pressure measured by a healthcare worker, they are considered screened. Among those screened, if they have been told by a healthcare worker that they had raised blood pressure, then they were diagnosed. So those who had taken hypertensive drugs in the past two weeks were considered treated. And we have two categories for treated, treated and overall untreated, and also among the diagnosed, treated and untreated. For those who have been treated for hypertension, if they were taking hypertensive drugs and their systolic blood pressure was below 140 or diastolic blood pressure was under 90, they were considered having controlled blood pressure. And the threshold was uh, a bit uh, lower for those with diabetes or kidney disease. So um, here I'm going to share with you the result of our study. This is a summary of the characteristic of our participants. So as you can see here, about 60% are between 50 to 59 years old. And, um, and there were more uh, females. The majority, uh, majority was Malay. So if you look at the ethnic composition, this is uh, very comparable to the national one. And the majority of our participants were married, 15% were widowed. And this study was conducted in a rural area. So um, about like 90% of the participants had only primary or secondary education. And about 78% had income less than 2,000 ringgit. So 2,000 ringgit is equivalent to about uh, 500 US dollar. And about 19% um, had uh, diabetes. So for mental distress, we categorize them into normal, mild or moderate, and severe. So as you can see here, the majority belong to the normal category. And we have a smaller percentage in the severe categories. And here is our main result, the hypertension care cascade by gender. So um, the orange, orange bar is male, 
yellow bar is female and green is a total male plus female. So if you just uh, pay attention to the green bars, right? So from 100% in total to about 72% screen to about 50% diagnosed and to about 38% treated and to about 15% control blood pressure. So as you can see here, from the total hypertension to control blood pressure, there is a loss of patients in every step of the cascade from 100% to 15%. This is indeed a great loss. So for every step in the cascade, if you look at males and females comparing them, so they are in every step, they are more females than males. And however, the difference is only significant for screen and diagnosed categories. And uh, we also conducted multivariate logistic regression to look at the association between hypertension care and mental distress adjusted um, for social demographics and diabetes status. Uh, the significant results are indicated with stars. So if you look at the first category, people who were not screened for hypertension, they had higher levels of depression, anxiety, and stress. So the OR is above, uh, significantly above one. And similarly, among those screened, those who were not diagnosed, they had higher level of depression. And interestingly, um, if you look at the treated and untreated uh, for all respondents and the diagnosed group, patients who were not treated actually had lower levels of depression yeah, and then a lower level of anxiety. And then the last one, when you compare those with controlled and uncontrolled blood pressure among those treated for hypertension, those who had uncontrolled blood pressure had higher levels of depression, anxiety, and stress. As you can see, the OR are above, are above significantly above one. So uh, in summary, for our study, along the hypertension care cascade, there is a loss of patient. So we did have a very interesting result. Hypertensive uh, individuals who were untreated had less mental distress compared to those who were treated. It could be that uh, those untreated are un unaware of the consequences of untreated hypertension. And then they also might have a more relaxed uh, attitude towards untreated hypertension. And um, those who are not screened or not diagnosed, they have more mental distress. So hypertension status could be a good indicator, good predictor of poor mental health. And those who are treated but have uncontrolled blood pressure, they also have more uh, mental distress. This could be due to clinical inertia, which is a failure to intensify therapy when treatment goal is not reached, and also a sense of hopelessness. The patients might feel like there's no way they can control their blood pressure. And this sense of hopelessness could lead to medical non-adherence. So they might not be taking their hypertensive medication accordingly. So our study has very important public health implications. Because there are differences in the association between mental distress and hypertension care, we could offer personalized strategies and interventions that target different needs along the cascade. For example, for those who are not screened or not diagnosed, they have higher mental distress. So what we can do is we can offer mental health screening while screening for hypertension. So screening both uh, uh, conditions side by side. So in Malaysia, it is okay to tell everyone you have hypertension. You can declare that openly, but it is very unlikely that a person will declare openly that he or she has mental illness for fear of discrimination. So providing a mental health screening together with hypertension screening could minimize stigmatization and discrimination. And there is also a need to follow up on hypertensive uh, patient to ensure the start of treatment and medical adherence, which could reduce mental distress. We could provide financial aids and counseling to encourage patients to stick to their treatment. And for another group of patients uh, who are very relaxed towards their hypertension, we could raise awareness of the consequences of untreated hypertension. So as you can see, 
here from this slide. So we can offer different health promotion programs that target different groups of patients. So in conclusion, our study shows that there is an association between the different levels of hypertension care and mental distress. And specific health interventions could be provided for patients with different needs along the cascade, which could improve the provision of mental health care. So here are the references for this study. Do have a look later if you want to know more about the background of the study. And um, thanks for listening. If you have any question about this study, do ask them later during the Q&A. Now I pass the time back to Professor Tintin. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, thank you for very clear presentations and then also calling uh, mental health uh, services to incorporate in the uh, NCD clinic. So I am sure there will be a lot of questions you know, during Q&A section. So because of the time pressure, I would like to call the third speaker, Ms. Anchue. Ms. Anchue is a research officer at the Southeast Asia Community Observatory, SIPO, Jeffrey Cha School of Medicine and Health Science, Monash University, Malaysia. She completed Master of Applying Statistics from the University of Malaya, and her research focused on NCD and its intersection with mental health. So, Ang, um, floor is yours. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, could you listen to my voice? Can you listen clearly? Yes, we can see uh, your slides and we can hear you very clearly. Thanks, Ang. Um, so, good morning to everyone from Malaysia and the topic for my presentation today is social economic inequality, frequent eating out and 10 year cardiovascular disease risk, evidence from an Asian country with developing economy. So for this case is in Malaysia. So in 2015, 73% of total death in Malaysia was due to non-communicable diseases NCD, and 35% of the death is contributed by cardiovascular diseases. And in 2019, cardiovascular diseases remain as one of the five principal causes of death in Malaysia, whereby about 16% of the deaths are due to ischemic heart diseases. And Ministry of Health had declared the three major CBD risk factors in Malaysia, which are hypertension, uh, which is a raised blood pressure, hypercholesteremia, uh, hypercholesterol which is the raised, to raised total cholesterol level, and diabetes. And in 2019, one in every five Malaysian adults that age 18 and above have diabetes and about 40% have hypercholesterolemia and then 30% have hypertension. And 8.1% of the Malaysian adults had lived with the three major CDC factors, while 16% of, uh, of them are living with two major CDC factors. And since the CDC individual may have one or more than one CBD risk factor, so the progression of a particular CBD risk factor cannot accurately predict the future CBD risk in the population level. However, the past study across developing countries including Malaysia on 10-year CBD risk predictions or the relationship between the lifestyle factors with the 10-year CBD risk predictions is still limited. Therefore, this study aims to predict the 10-year CBD risk among the Malaysians. Besides that, it is also aimed to identify the associations of social economic characteristics and lifestyle practices such as uh, behavior of eating outside and then the total physical of activity with the 10-year CBD risk. So, this study is a cross-sectional secondary data analysis and we are using the SICO health service data in 2013 and 2018 for the study and SICO has conducted the house-to-house -house interview to obtain information such as the socio-economic status, health conditions, lifestyle practices, and then they also undergo for anthropometric measurements. Besides that, the data collector also had conducted home-based health screening for the respondent that age 35 and above. 
the sample selection for this study are those uh, respondents that had conducted home-based screening and they had no history of heart diseases or stroke. And this is the flow of the sample selections. So firstly, we select those respondents that had conducted health screening, which are the respondents that age 35 and above. And then we excluded those respondents that reported to have heart disease or stroke. Besides that, we also excluded those respondents that have provided us incomplete or irrelevant answer for the survey. And then we finally, we got our find final sample, which is about 11,900 11, sample for 2013 data and 12,500 for 2018 data. And the method to, in order to get the 10 year CVD risk score, the Framingham risk score model were used. And the predictor for the FRS model include age, body mass index, antihypertension medication use, systolic blood pressure, smoking status, and diabetes status. And the each of the FRS points for each call are, are follow, we are follow the guideline proposed and the point score proposed by the FRS score, FRS model to obtain the point for each category. And then the FRS point for each category will be summed up. And then the total point of the obtained from the FRS model will be converted into the 10-year CVD risk. If an individual had less than 7% of the CVD risk, we will classify it as low CVD risk, 7 to 20% as moderate, and more than 20% we will classify as high predicted 10-year CVD risk. Score. And this table is the CVD risk by social economic and demographic characteristics uh, for the year 2013 and 2018. So in general, the proportions of high predicted cardiovascular risk had increased from 28% to 38% from 2013 and 2018. This is because as presented by Prof. Tin, the health profile uh, of the health, the health survey in 2018, the age pyramid has moved, shifted from, shifted to aging population. This is why the populations of uh, respondents that age 60 and above in 2000 interview is increased. Besides that, the um, proportions of uh, obese and overweight respondents also increased in 2018. Moreover, the diabetes care casket also show that the non-diabetic patients are also improving in 2018. This is why this all this improvement has caused the FIS point for each category to increase. And this is the reason why the high cardiovascular risk predicted in 2018 has have been increased. And according to this table, the, there's a drastic increment for the male respondent of getting the high cardiovascular risk in 2018 from about 47, 47% to 63%. And interestingly, as we can see, the Ab aboriginal uh, respondent reported to have, lo to have lower cardiovascular risk from the 2013 to 2018, which is means that they have shifted backward. The trend of their CVD risk has shifted to from high to low. And next, this is the from the aspect of education. Respondents that had high CVD risk are mostly come from those that had no formal education or those that have studied from until primary or secondary uh, education. And then the respondent that had income less than 2000 ringgit Malaysia also found to have increased in proportions of high predicted CVD risk. Besides that, from a uh, respondent that that are not working or other unspecified occupations such as pensioners, they also found to have increased in the percentage of high predicted CVD risk. And this table is the proportions of CVD risk with the 
dietary lifestyle and healthy lifestyle practices. And and we can and we can see that low uh, respondent with low level of total physical activity had increased in proportions of the high CVD predicted CVD risk in 2018. And from the aspect of eating a uh, meal eating outside, the proportions of high cardiovascular uh, diseases risk also found to have increased. And this table is the multi multiple linear regressions for the between the uh CVD risk with the selected uh social economic uh characteristic and healthy and lifestyle practices uh with the CVD risk in two thousand and thirteen. So the prevalence of low predicted CVD risk is. Uh, about 29%, moderate is about 43%, and high is about 28%. And the novel funding of our study is inclusions of Aboriginal group. And this is because uh, the past study in Malaysia has mainly focused on the three major ethnic, which is Malay, Chinese, and Indian. So our inclusions of Aboriginal group uh, have provided another new perspective of the of where the government should also focus on the other group beside the three major um, ethnic group and they have found that in 2018-13 data the aboriginal group have higher cvd risk predictor beside that the male respondent also found to have high cvd risk and respondents that are widow or widower also reported to have higher cvd risk and education is very important and highly associated with the cardiovascular risk. This is because the individual with lower education level will have poorer access and understanding of the health information. And this led them to have a lower health literacy. With lower health literacy, their knowledge on preventing the cardiovascular will be also lack as compared to those that had higher education. And Individual with higher income for this case is 1000 ringgit Malaysia and above also have lower predicted CVD risk. This is because low income will limit the individual to access the health services due to financial burden. And this is why with the, with due to the financial issues, the individual with low income will often neglect their own health condition. Res the result, the study also found that re respondents who were not paid employee, such as uh, homemakers, self-employed, also have higher CVD risk factors for this study. And there is no significant association between physical activity and cardiovascular risk for this for 2013 data. And respondents who reported eating solely at home or eating outside fewer per week also reported to have lower cardiovascular risk. This is because the food choices. Because eating at home, we will tend to uh, may, may have lower consumptions of fat, sodium, unlike in the out, uh, unlike the outside food, which are fat, uh, which are high in fat, high in sodium, that will contribute to the prevalence and increase the risk of a, in, an individual of getting cardiovascular disease. And this table is the multilinear regression for the cardiovascular diseases with uh, the selected social economic uh, characteristic in for 2018 data. And as we can see, actually the result in 2018 data is pretty similar with 2013 data, whereby male respondent had higher cardiovascular risk. And then those that had higher education level and higher income also reported to have lower cardiovascular risk. And respondents who were not paid employee also found to have higher cardiovascular risk. However, but from the aspect of uh, ethnicity, the Aboriginal found to have lower cardiovascular risk in 2018 data. And this is, uh, we also can see through the, the descriptive analysis that provided just now, whereby in 2018, Aboriginal group, the proportion of Aboriginal group of getting high cardiovascular risk has reduced. 
and the from the aspect of marital status, it was found that respondents that were never married reported to have lower cardiovascular risk, whereas the, the other marital status such as married, widow, separated, divorced, found to have higher cardiovascular risk. And interestingly, there is no association between frequency of eating out with 10 years CBD risk for this uh, for the 2018 data set. However, the respondent who had high level of physical activity found to have lower cardiovascular risk for the 2018 data. And as this is a cross-sectional study, so there's no, not much comparison that we could do. And currently we are doing, plan to do a follow-up research among the respondents that involved in Help Round Survey in 2013 and 2018 data. Uh, it's a longitudinal study on the predicted cardiovascular risk among those that had involved in both data sets. Uh, this is the what our the plan, the further plan, and currently we are doing and uh, the study that we are doing. And conclusion, there is an association between demographic, socioeconomic, and the uh, lifestyle practices with 10 year CBD risk. And it's essential for us to increase the level of health literacy. And by to, to do so, we should as the as the method of assessing and utilizing health information should be more age friendly and we should spread the health information through different channels apart from the internet, such as broadcasting, televisions, radios, newspaper, and much more. This is because the Respondent that the elderly found to have lower uh, level of health literacy is because they have difficulty in finding the source of health information. This is why the level of health literacy among the elderly in Malaysia is lower as compared to the other age group. Besides that, we also should promote healthy eating practices. Uh, by encourage the home cook meal and then beside that we should uh, the comparison of calorie fat and sodium content should be included in the health education material so that the people or the students will know uh, uh, how to cook uh, healthy and uh, nutrition um, and a uh, nutrition food uh, healthy food uh, so that they could reduce down the risk of the CBD. And besides that, it's important to raise the public awareness of healthy dietary and lifestyle. And this has been done and promoted uh, by the Malaysian government, where they have, prom uh, they have introduced healthy eating, physical activity, and promoting people to do more exercise, eating healthily. And then besides that, the public health intervention should also focus on the minority community, such as the uh, Aborigines and the other uh, immigrants, migrants, uh, uh, the other migrants, uh, my apologies, uh, from the other migrants. Uh, as we can see, the study have provided that the Aborigine group also have been affected uh, from this uh, cardiovascular risk. That's all for me. Thank you. If you have any further questions, uh, we will dis we will answer it at the Q and A sessions. Yeah, later. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you. you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, thanks for very rich uh, information and a very rich uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And then there are a question for you by Dr. Faisal. So hopefully you can answer the questions, you know, by responding by chat. So uh, I will. Uh, introduce uh, the last uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Devi Mohan. So Dr. Devi Mohan is a senior lecturer in the Global Public Health, Jeffrey Chas School of Medicine and Health Science since uh, 2015. She's a public health physician and epidemiologist. Dr. Devi Mohan uh, research expertise in aging and the her main research focus is in geriatric neuroepidemiology, including dementia and cognitive impairment. Devi? Floor is yours. Thank you, Prof. Tin. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I hope you can see my slides now. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting on the topic population wide screening for atrial fibrillation among older adults in semi rural Malaysia. 
And uh, these are my co-authors. This was a work done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Ben Friedman from University of Sydney, uh, Kwansia from Malaysia, Monash University, Blossom Stephen from University of Nottingham, Prof. Tin, Prof. Pascal and Prof. Daniel, who were previously heading SECO. Yep, so what is atrial fibrillation? As we all know, uh, in a normal heart rhythm, as you can see in this video, there is synchronous contraction between atria and ventricle. Whereas in atrial fibrillation, there is asynchronous contractions and signals coming from the atria. So the atria and ventricle are not in rhythm. And this, as you can see in the video, this can lead to many complications. Uh, so why is AFib important? Is it important in terms of its epidemiology? Yes, it is. Because AFib is the most prevalent cardiac arrhythmia, non in clinical scenarios. It's estimated, it, the term is it's not prevalence, but rather an estimation that uh, around 33.5 million people were living with AF globally in 2010, and it's predicted to increase. Uh, it's an estimation because AF by its nature can present in asymptomatic form. As you can see, this is a world epidemiology, the global epidemiology on AFib, which shows a clear increasing trend in AFib. This is mostly attributed to the aging population who lives with multiple comorbidities, which are by themselves risk factors for AFib. And it contributes so much to the mortality through stroke, most importantly, and that also shows an increasing pattern in terms of the mortality that we can attribute to AF. So it makes us realize, yes, AFib is important and requires public health consideration. How in the context of NCD it is? So may not be epidemiologically correct, but we can say it's a cause and consequence of NCDs cause, but not a cause, in fact, risk factors. As Prof. Tin, Ms. Ang, and Dr. Tin Tin presented, all these risk factors contribute to AF. Let it be age, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, lifestyle, including smoking, alcohol, and the ever-increasing prevalence of obesity, as rightly Prof. Tin mentioned in her presentation, all this contributes to increasing prevalence and incidence of AF. And it can also lead to other in CDs, most important being stroke. And stroke is one of the leading cause of mortality and morbidity throughout the world, and most importantly in Malaysia as well. And hospitalizations, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, and now it's increasingly proven that atrial fibrillation is related to cognition and dementia, which is another important morbidity among older people. So it's, it, it's beyond doubt that early detection of AF is important to prevent complications. But how is usually AF detected? It is detected usually not in the community, but in a hospital setting using 12 lead ECGs. This is how an ECG, a 12 lead ECG would look like. I don't intend uh, all of us to go through this, but, but it's not as simple as that it can be done in a community setting. So this is how a 12 lead ECG is done for the actual diagnosis of AFib. Clearly, it shows this cannot be done in community level because of the logistics around it with, with it and the cultural aspects, especially in Asian communities. So there is definite indication that we can do and should do a community-wide screening for AFIP because of increasing prevalence of its risk factors and aging population and to prevent complications and mortality, which I just showed you in the slide before, but clearly a 12 lead ECG is not an effective method. So in our study, we aim to screen for AFib in community dwelling older adults using a single lead mobile ECG. And we also aim to look at the validity of the single lead mobile ECG as against a cardiologist diagnosis of those tracings which were given by the single lead ECG. So let's go into how the study was undertaken. Uh, yes, like uh, it was earlier mentioned in the CECO, it gives opportunities for multiple embedded studies. So this was such a study, a cross-sectional study, which was embedded in the HDSS of CECO in Malaysia. And all CECO participants who were enrolled as part of Health Round, who were 70 years and above, were recruited, were approached for the study, and all consenting 70 plus adults were assessed as part of the study. Uh, interviews were conducted by data collectors who were trained in the use of this, and this was conducted during a home visit. The study variables, the outcome variable that we assessed was FIP. This was assessed using a live core cardia mobile ECG. So this is a mobile ECG, uh, which you can attach with the single lead, and the readings are taken through a smartphone. It gives a 30 seconds recording, 
and identifies the presence of a possible atrial fibrillation. In addition, we also collected sociodemographic variables, all the comorbidities that would possibly be associated with AF and the lifestyle factors. Another thing that we did was all positive possible AF cases were provided referral because definitely we had to educate patients. It's not a diagnosis, but rather a possibility. So they were provided a referral to approach the Ministry of Healthcare facility. This was done in consultation with MOH so that they can undergo detailed evaluation as per the discretion of the, discretion of the medical officer. And all the tracings which we could download as PDF were validated, uh, uh, all AF, positive tracings were validated by a cardiologist, plus a random sample of normal tracings, which we took as double the number of AF positives. So all these tracings were validated by a cardiologist. So this is how the uh, a live core cardiac app would look like. So this is a handheld lead that we can see the cardiac, and this is a tracing that we get. It's a 30 second tracing. At the end of 30 seconds, uh, the app will give you a normal ECG tracing or it indicates a possible AFib. Okay, so coming to the results, uh, 2,435 participants were assessed who were eligible with a mean age of 76 and a standard deviation of five. Um, nearly half, like 46.5% were male participants and as Malaysia is a multi-ethnic country, we had an ethnic distribution of mostly contributed by Malay, followed by Chinese participants, Indians, and others. Looking at the risk factor profile of baseline risk factor profile of these participants, uh, around 22% had WHO recommended level of physical activity, 10% were current smokers, and 3% reported alcohol use. With regards to comorbidities, which are all self-reported, Diabetes was reported among 27%, that hypertension, 59%, obviously, because this is a very old population, which is 70 plus. So the prevalence of proportion, I would say, for hypertension would be, was 59%. A stroke history was reported among 4.8% and atrial fibrillation among 84 participants. So th these were previously diagnosed AFib cases. These were the screening results. So using the ECG mobile algorithm, we detected 57 AF cases, which accounted to 2.34% in our population. And out of this is the interesting finding that is out of this 57, 45, that is nearly 80% were newly detected. That is, they never had a previous history of AF. And this coincides with another other previous studies, which reports that AF, the a life co mobile ECG is more important in asymptomatic patients, but not much in AF patients. And this accounts to 1.8% of our total participants. So as a, as a fact of the screening, as a result, we detected 1.8% of 70 per plus older adults who had a possible AF. And among these participants, the age, the mean age was 76%, males 51%. Among the AF positives, Around 80% had a history of hypertension, 36.9% uh, were diabetic people, and around 8.5% had a history of stroke. So these were the AF, AFib screening positive patients. And now, as I told, the second objective was to validate this against a cardiologist diagnosis of the tracing. Uh, as we can see, these are the cardiologist diagnosis versus the app diagnosis. So there were 57 AF cases, and double the number of normals, which were validated by a cardiologist. Uh, looking at the tables, the diagnostic test evaluation, the accuracy was 90.6% for the Alive Core app in, di in diagnosis of diagnosing a possible AFib. It was sensitive 100%, a specificity of 89.8%. And uh, the positive predictive value was 71.9 and negative predictive value of 100%. So I would like to conclude from that result that it's very good in ruling out in the community, but rather it's not a definite positive diagnostic test, but helps in referral for further review. The conclusion is single lady handheld ECG is a good tool for community level screening of atrial fibrillation. It's valid with an accuracy of around 90%. It's acceptable because we had the response rate of 90% less. 
It aids in referral of those older adults who require further medical evaluation, and the results of the proportion reported were comparable to other community-based estimates. So the question comes, if there are community-based estimates, why would we do this? But those community-based estimates were all based on 12 EDCG, which is not logistically possible for a population-level screening. But of course, I would like to acknowledge there were some limitations that paroxysmal AFib is common, which could be missed, but that can even be missed with the 12 EDCG. Uh, and there was a 5.7% of cases which were detected as unclassified ECGs. This is a further work on progress that we would like to know what kind of cases are misdiagnosed as unclassified. And in our study, we didn't validate it against the 12 EDCG, but there are studies from around the globe in Belgium, Germany, and all, which says the app diagnosis is a good surrogate of 12 ECG in, in asymptomatic individuals. The way forward for the study would be, it helps us to do incident studies of AFIP, and also most importantly, to follow up this population to see the level of incidence of complications, mortality, stroke, et cetera. So that's the advantage I would see with the HDSS of integrating the study into that. So to put everything together from what Prof. Tin has talked, Dr. Min Min has talked about, and Ms. Ang has talked about NCD, what is the core contributing in terms of NCD care and management? We can see the population in CECO as globally is aging, but we can see it's a very high proportion like due to relative out migration, most probably. It has 26.5% of the population who are aged. Uh, increasing prevalence of NCDs and its risk factor, most importantly, obesity. And it's very clear that HDSS facilitates to bridge the gap. There was a clear evidence from the cascade of care. There's a gap between what's needed and what's provided. So HDSS facilitates to bridge this gap in terms of need and service delivery. And uh, from Dr. Min Min's presentation, it was very clear. Yes, there is an intersection between NCD and mental health. So we strongly recommend that integrated NCD care services uh, are provided, which includes mental health prevention and promotion. HDSS clearly provides an opportunity for cardiovascular risk prediction and determinants. And as Ming, as Ms. Ang suggested, uh, our plans are to follow them up to see the predictive accuracy of these risk prediction models within the HDSS setting. And screening of conditions are possible and one example was AFib that I presented that we can prevent complication, which is a tertiary level of prevention. And all this together put can all help develop population-based complex interventions for prevention and controlling NCD. And we are all, as public health people, are very interested to see where it stands in the level of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. This is a natural history of NCD. So how does CEPO fit into this natural history of NCD. Are we intervening at any levels? Yes, we are. We are intervening at primary level by detecting risk factors, helping prevent disease incidents, reducing the risk, uh, risk of uh, diseases in CDs. Yes, we are intervening at secondary level by early detection and referral in collaboration with Ministry of Health. And yes, we are helping prevent complications and uh, detecting these complications and providing early referral and throughout this spectrum, SICU has been able to provide policy recommendations, capacity building, especially local sustainable capacity building, and provide models of diagnosis and care in NCD management. And I would like to say through this, in NCD care, SICU tries to provide research for a healthy community. And I acknowledge that the FA part, which was embedded, uh, was funded by the Monash Lab Strategy Grant. I thank all the SICO team members and collaborators. These are my references, and thank you. For any questions, please reach out to this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Devi. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. And then also uh, showing the opportunity to screen atrial fibrillation to include in the community-based screening. And then thank you very much for a very nice closing of uh, HDSS contribution to NCD prevention and control. So we are uh, quite okay. And thanks all speakers for keeping your time. So we are 11, 12 uh, a.m. in Kuala Lumpur. So we have another uh, 15 to uh, 20 minutes. So my co-chair, my colleague, uh, shall we invite uh, Professor 
Annie Marito from the University of Sydney. So she's kindly agreed to be a discussant for this section. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you again for the invitation. I've really enjoyed the session and I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to act as respondent. Um, I, what I was really struck by in listening to these really excellent presentations from Professor Tintin speaking about the design and objectives of the HCSS, uh, Dr. Min Min speaking specifically about interactions between mental health and hypertension and understanding that dynamic better, uh, Ms. Ang, Chun, Ang Chu Wei speaking about various associations with NC uh, cardiovascular disease risk, and then most recently Dr. Devi Mohan speaking about um, the importance of screening and understanding some of the facilitators of screening. I was really struck, and I think this follows on from Dr. Mohan's uh, final point with the policy implications of all of this research and particularly the importance of really robust evidence such as this in informing policy moving forward. So I wanted to take my time briefly as respondent to reflect on this and to think about uh, the policy implications in part from the perspective of policy making. Um, my, feel, my focus in terms of research is on understanding policy processes and what influences policy and I wanted to reflect um, briefly on that. In, so we know for example uh, that one of the things that influences policy is the ideas and frames, so the understanding of an issue is incredibly influential. And this includes uh, both public understanding and presentation of a particular issue, such as, for example, cardiovascular disease and its causes, diabetes and what causes it, but also the understanding of policymakers themselves who are influenced by, for example, discussions in the media, uh, influenced by discussions with family and friends, as we all are. And so, particularly with respect to this huge influence of ideas and framings of an issue, presenting robust evidence to be able to strengthen and to present um, strong and detailed evidence-based discussion of these critical health policy issues is actually in itself really important in shaping policy. The power of these findings that have been discussed in the panel today in influencing public discourse about an issue shouldn't be underestimated. Another thing that influences policy is institutional structures and priorities. And again, I see evidence such as this as being incredibly powerful in being able to identify gaps in current priorities by identifying in more detail the, cause, the, the nature of, the prevalence of, and the causes of priority health issues for policymakers. It also creates opportunities for um, identification of the role and potential for new institutional structures. So in this case, for example, I was particularly struck uh, by Dr. Tan's presentation on that intersection between mental health and hypertension in perhaps highlighting the importance and the dynamics in terms of um, a multi-sectoral committee for non-communicable diseases. Um, which I know already exists in Malaysia, for example, but it also, I think, can highlight, for example, um, which institutions are most critical and relevant to involve in these discussions. Um, finally, one of the most uh, powerful influences on policy is actually the existing policy content. There's a, there's a policy saying that policy at time equals one is most strongly influenced by policy at time equals zero. And so I think one of the powerful ways that evidence can also impact policy is by highlighting a specific point within the current policy environment that are amenable to change and that uh, could be redesigned or rethought in order to generate more positive health outcomes. This I was really struck by in uh, Dr. Mohan's presentation in terms of the way that her nuanced description and um, understanding of factors associated with screening uh, could actually highlight ways, really specific uh, policy changes and the opportunities for that. 
The second thing and related that I wanted to highlight was the importance of evidence to enable the design of strategic policy. Um, we're increasingly recognizing uh, in the global health space that considering and understanding the environments in which people make decisions about their health or make decisions that affect their health um, are really critical. Those broader environments, these broader associations that determine health behaviours are critical to understand because um, effective policy must respond to the lived experience of people, the environments in which they live, factors that actually shape their health-related behaviours. And nuanced analyses such as the ones that have been presented today, I think, offer really important insights for policymakers about what really needs to be targeted and where change can have the most impact on people's health. Finally, I wanted to, I guess, point, think about and reflect on future uh, research with respect to policy and the opportunities there. And in particular, I was reflecting as I was listening on the potential for data such as these, particularly as there's increasing capacity for longitudinal analyses to inform or from the basis of uh, evaluation of real world or natural experiment type studies um, to look at the impact over time of population wide interventions and to understand some of what might contribute to policy success or indeed policy failure. Because it's, I think, information about not only where we where we do have those successes, but also understanding uh, where perhaps policy isn't working as effectively as it could are really important. Um, so again, oh, and sorry, one final point was also in line with that, that these data I think are also exciting because of the potential for high quality disaggregation of population subgroups. Because we're also recognizing that while we talk about, and I think we need population-wide interventions, it's also really important to understand that not all populations are the same. They don't all respond the same way to policy intervention and they don't all have the same needs. So I think huge opportunities for research in understanding um, those subpopulation dynamics in respect to health behaviours and health policy. Thank you again for the opportunity to respond and to listen to these talks. I'll hand back over to the chair. Uh, thanks, Anne. It's a very good reflection. And then also you uh, connect with the health policy. And this is a, your uh, area of expertise. So this is also the way we are looking forward to do some population level you know, complex interventions and then you know, evidence informed policy um, making process. So thank you very much. And thanks again for your uh, interesting uh, comments and um, suggestion. So I think we have to end this section so within a couple of minutes. So I will hand over this section to my co-chair, uh, Professor Chan Yun Tong from Mahiro University. So uh, could you give me some last comments? Because uh, we have already answered questions from the chat. So any more questions and then any comments uh, from the floor? Thank you, Professor Tin Tin. Uh, it's very impressive work that uh, Siego had conducted. And uh, I observed from the map that uh, it's not all over Asia yet. So I think it, it might be good that we should join hand because in Thailand at uh, our faculty, we also have uh, established a similar uh, system in the community research. So uh, I hope that in the future, we can compare the outcome and uh, regarding policy advocacy, we also working towards that line. And hopefully we can uh, save the whole region by working together. And I think that's the purpose of our uh, network. So uh, thank you very much and hope to uh, see all of you in person next time, next uh, conference. Thank you. Sawadika. Thank you very much. So we share hand over this uh, section to Professor Indika. Uh, Prof. Indika, the chair, the floor is yours. 
and I thank all the resource persons and CFO for organizing this very important symposium, which we have shared a lot of valuable information. And also I thank all the participants and also Professor Anne-Marie, uh, who has provided her expert comments and shared the expertise. So with that, we conclude this session.